We'll just start with in Our Father, the prayer where Jesus taught us to pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This day, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And we entrust our day to Mary, who lived in the divine will perfectly. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Hannibal de Francia, Saint Alphonsus. So we are running, uh, as Father uh, Nicholas Dillon was delayed getting back from New Zealand and everything started a bit later, we're running 15 minutes behind the original schedule today. Um, uh, John Canavan from the Divine Mercy Centre was here last night. He can't be here today. He's got a talk somewhere. And I mentioned the prayer that I say for priests, the one that I say when I'm going to sleep at night, and I couldn't remember it because I wasn't in bed. I remember it when I'm in bed. <laughs> but he left copies of this, which you can take if you wish. They're uh, free. If you want to give a donation to the Divine Mercy Publications, there is a, a box over there. Yes, and the girls will them to you. So the girls will hand them to you. We don't want you taking multiple copies, but take a, everyone's entitled to a copy of this, and hopefully you will pray it, because goodness me, the devil is really attacking the priesthood. And there are lots of not good things going on, particularly in the country areas. Oh dear. Uh, there seem to be a lot of good priests in the cities like Melbourne and Sydney, but boy, when you get into the country, some of the things the priests are doing are terrible. So we really need to pray for priests. Now, before you go on, Father, I just want to remind the folks here, first of all, welcome to, to us uh, to the retreat today. Um, if you haven't registered, um, I know a lot of you were here from last night and you registered, so you don't need to register again. Those who are new today, make sure you register so we have your details so we can update you with any information and news. The uh, event is being recorded, so when it's uploaded, if, you, if we have your details, your email address, I can advise you uh, of the link so you can um, have another look at it. Um, so, um, also, uh, there is a donation. The uh, retreat is free. We're not charging for it when I say, but it's free. Nothing's free. <laughs> um, uh, donations for the retreat are in uh, the white tub on that table there, on the registration uh, table. Um, and uh, there are other handouts that have been uh, made available uh, by donation. And there's another donation box over there for the documents. Um, that's the main thing. Um, so over to you, Father. Thank you. Very good. Right, oh well, um, how many of you were not here last night? Let me just see how many. So most of you were. Yes, okay. So th this talk will, it's, this is an introduction to living in the divine will. I'm giving it now because um, I know there are always people joining a retreat like this who can't be there every day. And some of the things that are in this first talk would have been said last night, but it's always good to rethink, re uh, think again the, base, the basic ideas of living in the divine will. <coughs> the one who's there on the desk, her picture, and the one here on the screen, Luisa Picaretta, she's an Italian lady who it was the one that God revealed so many wonderful things about living in the divine will. Now, St. Paul already prayed, 
in his letter to the Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 to 10 he said we have never failed to remember you in our prayers and ask that through perfect wisdom and spiritual understanding you should reach the fullest knowledge of his will and so be able to lead a life worthy of the Lord. Well, St. Paul wrote these things and wrote beautiful things, but in everything he wrote there are deeper levels of understanding. All revelation is contained in the scriptures, but not everything has been explicit, as the Catechism tells us. And so through the church's years, we gradually come to a deeper understanding of the truths that are already there in the Bible. And one of the things is this, when we're praying to reach the fullest knowledge of his will, we have the opportunity today to understand this much better than St. Paul ever could. And a beautiful prayer that he made, which we can make our own during this days, from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, <coughs> Glory be to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Now there's nothing that I know that fulfills that more than the teachings given to Louisa Picaretta, whereby we are able to act in a divine way. It's infinitely more than we could possibly ask for or imagine. By the power of God, nothing is impossible to God. So um, just a quick refreshing for those who weren't here last night of Louisa. She was born to what's now Divine Mercy Sunday in 1865. And then at the age of 13, she had this vision of the suffering Jesus, which was to transform her. Now, from the age of 17, and remember, she lived to just a few days short of 82 years of age, so for almost 65 years, she lived only on Holy Communion. No food, no water. Longer than any other mystics. There were some other mystics in history that have lived on Communion, like Teresa Newman, but they didn't live that long, 17 to almost 82. From age 22, she was confined permanently to bed. This is the vision, of, this is an artist's depiction of the vision that she had when she was uh, 13 years old. <coughs> she looked out from the balcony where she lived. Maybe some of you have been to that little place in Corato where she lived. How many have been to Corato? Oh, only three of you? I've been there too, yes. That's the place where she lived in southern Italy. And uh, that building is still there, and it's kind of a shrine to her now. So she saw Jesus, uh, she had this vision of Jesus out in the street, carrying his cross, and being tormented by the crowd who were abusing him and shouting abuse at him. And he called out to her, soul, help me. And that had that very profound effect on her. She was never the same after that. Then on October the 6th, um, the next one, October the 16th, 1888, this was a dramatic moment in human history. <clears throat> the beginning of the fulfillment of the will of the prayer of the Our Father. Up till then, the only ones who'd ever lived perfectly in the divine will were Adam and Eve before the fall, before they fell. They had the gift of living in the God, divine will, of returning to God all the glory and love that he poured out. God created this universe with so much love for the human race and for every one of us. So he created all the animals, the birds, 
the trees, the fruits, the vegetables. He created all the massive amounts of stars, trillions of them we know now, since the James Webb telescope went up there. It's, it's shown us how much bigger and more extraordinary is the universe than we ever dreamt of. All of this was created out of love for Adam and Eve and for each one of us. But of course, they were tested by God, they failed the test, they lost that gift of the divine will. So since then, only Jesus and Mary lived perfectly in the divine will until Louisa Bigaretta. And of course she was, let's see, what year was she born now? 40, 47, so she must have been 41 years old when she actually received the gift of living in the divine will. So from then on, she was living in a life that was giving perfect glory and honor to God. <coughs> and since she has done that, this gift is now available to all those who want it and desire it. And that's why you've come here for this weekend. It, it's like that idea of coming here was put into your mind by God in his great love. Because he wants you to live this way. He wants all of us to live this way in the divine will. And um, so she was the first. Now since then, of course, there have been lots of people because once that gift was returned to us, those who respond to it have it. So people like St. Faustina certainly lived in the divine will. St. Therese of the infant Jesus, the great saints of our time, Mother Teresa, they lived perfectly in the divine will because this gift was available now for those who desire it and who dispose themselves to live that way. So it's also available for us. There's a little, this is a book that was written by a priest I never knew, but he, some of you in Melbourne would know him, a Jesuit. Um, I'm trying to remember his name now. He, he died a number of years ago. Father Ma, that's right. I've heard of him. And one of the things that he wrote in this, I like to read this out because it's an encouragement. One of the things that will happen, once you hear these things, the devil will say to you, well, this is not for you. You could never do this. This, this is for other people. These are the good people here like Graham and, um, and what's her name? I'm trying to think of her name, I can't think. Grace, that's right. You know, they're all right. They can live this way, but not Philip. They're too much for you, Philip, isn't it? Well, I hope not. <laughs> But that's the temptation. The devil will be suggesting that to all of you. He doesn't want this. He doesn't want people to be doing it. So he'll be saying, well, that's all right. It's good for these holy people, but not for me. I'll never measure up to this. So this is beautiful what Father um, Ma wrote. All this seems so, so marvelous that we can live in the divine will and give perfect glory to God. That God should love us so much seems almost incredible. Yet it seems that to possess and live in the divine will would be impossible. Look how hard and rare it is for one to be a canonized saint. And yet we're told that this living in the divine will is a sanctity surpassing even that of the great saints. How can this be true? That ordinary people, ordinary people could be capable of living in the divine will. I answer, who can fathom the mystery of God's will? I do not believe that I could ever be a great saint. Yet I believe that I can accept this gift of the divine will, which Jesus wants so much to give us, which Mary, our mother, so longs for her children to have. This is why God created the human race. It was most easy for Adam and Eve to have this gift. And then Jesus suffered so much to regain it for us. How can one disdain the gift of so great a giver? Would this not be a great insult to his supreme majesty? <coughs> now it's certain we don't deserve it, nor could we ever merit it. 
to anything we might do or conceive of doing. But who deserves existence? Who deserves human life? Who deserves grace? Who deserves the gift of receiving Jesus in Holy Communion? But God wants it. It's a divine decree. We must let him have his way. And if one person doesn't accept his gift, another will. <coughs> so in a way we are privileged because <coughs> this is only in the early stages, you might say. This knowledge is in the early stages of spreading around the world. I think there will be a great explosion of this when eventually the beatification and canonization of Louisa happens. But that hasn't. So the number of people, like here in Melbourne, particularly in Melbourne, very few people are aware of this and living in this way. There are a few groups. And so you are privileged. You've been invited and God's giving you this gift. So don't think this is beyond me. It's, it's not beyond any of us. Well, it is beyond any of us to merit this gift, but God wants to give it to each one of us. Now, <clears throat> so this is a beautiful prayer there that glory be to him, his power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. I think I'm going backwards. <laughs> Sorry, I went backwards. Uh, and just a, um, about Louisa, because it's important to realize that Louisa is truly worth listening to and credible. So she came from a diocese in southern Italy called the Archdiocese of Trani in Nazareth. And um, there was an archbishop who allowed mass to be said every day <coughs> in Louisa's room. After all, she was combined, confined to bed. So an altar was set up there, and every day a priest would come and celebrate mass. <coughs> now that was strictly forbidden in those days for mass to be celebrated in a room like that. <coughs> But this bishop, archbishop, realizing the sanctity and holiness of Louisa and the fact that this was extraordinary, that she couldn't move out of her bed, allowed priests to come every day and celebrate Mass. Now a new archbishop came along and he said, well, this is against the church's law, and he was, uh, he was uh, going to sign a decree to prevent the priests from visiting her room and saying Mass there. But as his hand approached the paper to sign it, his arm and part of his body were at once paralyzed. So he realized then, and he asked to be taken to Louisa's home. And then as soon as Louisa saw him, she said, would you give me your blessing, Archbishop? As soon as he raised, uh, at that moment, he was able to raise his arm and bless her as if nothing had happened. He was instantly cured. So then in 2005, it, up till then they had a diocesan process to examine her. The first stage in beatification is done in the diocese where people have lived. So um, with Eileen O'Connor, who was actually born in Melbourne, <coughs> but whose family moved to Sydney, <coughs> and who died in Sydney. I was present about three years ago when Archbishop Fisher in Sydney began for, formally the process, the diocesan process for her beatification. And uh, I think the Indian bishops have done that for another Victorian girl, uh, Mary Glowry. They, they, they've instituted her beatification process in India because that's where she did such great work. So, um, that was completed in 2005, and the whole thing was moved over to the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints. Normally, that's the congregation that deals with these things. But because of the extraordinary nature of the revelations to her, this was moved from the ordinary process of the Congregation of the Saints to the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. 
the most important congregation. And so they are the ones who've been investigating and completing the process for beatification. <coughs> Now some of you, a few of you, just a small number of you belong to prayer groups and Louise was telling me about one that she has. So we'll find out before we leave where there are prayer groups and those who would like to have a prayer group in different parts of Melbourne so that this can be spread. The postulation, that means those who are working towards the beatification of Louisa, the postulator is the one in charge of that. <coughs> They encourage prayer groups in the various diocese of the world to spread Louisa's fame of holiness. And it especially desires that her great devotion to the Mother of God be imitated. It urges, whenever possible, groups be conducted under the guidance of a prudent priest, a proven orthodoxy. It would be good if you could in, encourage Father Nicholas to, <laughs> to, to join you and supervise your groups because he is a prudent priest of proven orthodoxy. The supervision of prayer groups falls under the competence of each diocesan bishop. So if a bishop forbade it, you would have to obey him. But I don't know of any bishops that have forbade it. And there are three dioceses in Australia that have formally approved it and given it a great blessing. <coughs> and we also are encouraged to pray to Louisa, but of course we can't ve publicly venerate her yet because she is not yet beatified or canonized. Oh, I'm, I'm just wondering if I'm wrong, showing the wrong one. I, um, oh, I think I might be showing the one I shared yesterday. I've probably opened the wrong one. opened the wrong one. My fault was that I had two of them with the, the same one with two different names, so I'll have to go to another one. Sorry about this, I made a mistake. And, uh, oh, this is where an old man is not always as competent <coughs> in handling the computer as he should be. Um, I think I'd better do another one and I'll prepare the one I was going to give the introductory one later on. So we'll go into the one, the Hours of the Passion. I think we'll do that now and I'll have time to organize things better. Well, I showed you that picture and I also mentioned yesterday that when St. Hannibal went to see Pope Pius X, St. Pius X, and when he read a few pages of the Hours of the Passion to him, the Pope said, this book should be read while kneeling. It's Jesus Christ who is speaking. And he, of course, was a saint, St. Pius X. And Saint, now, St. Hannibal said, he was the extraordinary confessor and he was the censor of books who approved the Hours of the Passion, the first 19 of the volumes of the Book of Heaven and the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Divine Will. He approved all of these as censor of books and the Archbishop there gave his imprimatur. So he affirmed that this is important now. Louise's meditation on Jesus' Passion constitutes a new method 
totally new approach, which Louisa was the first to introduce to the church. It offers reparations that extend and multiply themselves to infinity. Indeed, Jesus reveals to Louisa that as the soul meditates on the hours of the Passion, we have volumes of them there available for you to purchase, and I hope everyone will get one of these, that he dictated to her, the soul who does it assumes his own humanity, intercedes for souls, offers the Father reparation and satisfaction and averts his divine justice. Such a soul procures new graces, a new life of grace, and all the goods that Jesus desires. Now, this is the difference between the way of praying these hours of the Passion and previous books of meditation. For example, as a Redemptorist, I'm a follower of St. Alphonsus Liguri, our founder. St. Alphonsus wrote three books of meditation on the Passion of the Lord. And um, we have often used these books in our evening meditation to reflect on the Passion and all that Jesus suffered. So when we were doing that, we were really thinking of his pains, pitying them, praying to him. But when we use this book, we are in the divine will, we repeat the, to repeat in the soul, my passion, Jesus said, in act. That term, in act, is a theological term, and it refers to God. Everything for God is in act. In our life, we have what's happened before, what's over and done with, and no longer exists. And what's going to happen in the future, it hasn't started yet, it doesn't exist. We have only the present moment. And those of you who've read the saints, you'll know that the saints are always emphasizing to live in the present moment. Don't live in the past, don't hang on to the things and the hurts and everything of the past. Don't hang on to the sins that you've done and that have been forgiven in confession and so on. Don't worry about the past. Don't be worried about the future and anxious. What's going to happen? So many people live in fear and anxiety about the future. That's not the Christian way to live. We, in the way the saints have always told us, live in the present moment, because that's all we have. But God is always in act. With God, there's no past, there's no future. Everything is present to God. That's why Jesus, even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was aware of every sin, of every person, of every generation. They were all present to him in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's why he was so overwhelmed because the ugliness of those sins to him was terrible. And he was taking on himself to make reparation atone for all those sins, including ours, we all added to his suffering there. So God is always in act. <clears throat> so if we are in the divine will and praying these hours of the Passion, Jesus says to repeat in the soul, my Passion in act is different from one who only thinks of my pains and pities them. The former is an act of my own life. That's in the divine will that the soul accomplishes, which takes my place and repeats my pains. Whereas I feel requited for the effects and the value of a divine life. The other one, the one that was available to saints of previous times, in thinking of my pains and in offering me pity, permits me to experience only the soul's company. But do you know in whom I may repeat, repeat the pains of my passion in act? In the soul who possesses my will as the center of its life. My will alone is one act without succession of acts. You know, this is something really too much for our minds to grasp because we are so used to everything being a succession of acts. <coughs> <coughs> the, 
this single act is as though fixed to one point which never moves and this point is eternity. Now the soul who lives in my will possesses this single act and there's no wonder that it takes part in the pains of my passion as if they were in act. Furthermore, meditation on the hours of Jesus' passion benefits the one who reads it. It's something that I do every day. Read one of these hours of the passion. I'm sure a number of you are doing it already. So what are the effects? <coughs> the sinner will turn to God. The imperfect will become perfect. The saint will become holier. Those who are tempted will find victory. And those who are ill will discover strength, medicine and comfort. Indeed, through the meditation of these hours, the soul attains the grace of strength to overcome all weakness. It's a most powerful prayer. And as you do it over time, these things don't happen instantly and you don't notice the change instantly but if you look back two or three years and think of what you were like before you started to read these hours of the passion and pray them and live in the divine will you say oh yes god has really been working in me now he, uh, these are words of jesus to her if they meditate on these hours together with me so we do it together with him and with my own will, entering into his will. Now listen to this. I will give them a, a soul for each word they recite. This is astonishing and this is what motivates me to try never to omit praying something of the hours of the Passion every day. <coughs> Imagine to be able to save a soul from eternal misery and damnation. There are so many billions of people on the earth. There have been so many generations. There are so many of them that don't have any of this knowledge, don't even know Jesus, don't have any of the opportunities we've had. And we can save them through each word that we recite. The greater or lesser efficacy of these hours of my passion is measured by the greater or lesser union that they have with me while reciting these hours. In meditating on these hours with my will, the soul conceals itself within my will. And since it's my will that is operating in the soul, I can through this soul engender all the blessings I want, even through one single word. And I can do this each time the soul meditates on these hours. We have to think all the time we are dealing with a God. Nothing is impossible to God. And the more we are aware of our own nothingness and incapacity, the more God can work in us so these things are impossible to human beings, but nothing's impossible to God. He wants to do it through us. He wants to save many peoples through us. We have to think of what was the great love of Jesus. He said, would I, these are words he said to Louisa, would I not have suffered my whole passion, even if only one soul, was saved. God's love is so different from ours. Well, St. John said, God is love. Now we as human beings, we have a limited compassion, ca uh, capacity to love. We, hopefully we love our parents more. It's more natural for us to love our parents. And it's easier for us to love them. There are people that we can, we can be very close to and they're good friends and we love them. 
But there are other people, they're just acquaintances, so our love for them is nothing the same. And then, of course, there are people that we don't know at all. And Jesus, when he was on this earth, he allowed himself to be very restricted in his human nature. So he too had people that he loved more than others. Obviously, he loved his mother the most of all, loved St. Joseph. Even among the apostles, he had favorites, Peter, James, and John. And of course, the apostles were closer to him, but he did love everybody, but he, he was limited because he allowed himself to be limited by time and space. But now he's risen from the dead. There's no limit at all. And God's love can't be measured out. So he can't love Lisa more than he loves Philip. It doesn't matter. Lisa might be 50,000 times more holy than Philip. I'm sure she's not, but supposing she were, does that mean God's going to love her more than her son here? Because he's a, supposing he's a wild, he wouldn't be, but supposing he was a wild and foolish fellow. But God will love him just as much as he loves somebody who's extremely holy and saintly. It's no, we're not like that. We tend to love some people more than others, and we, it's all we can do. But he is love. There's no measure to God's love. There's no limit to it. He loves every single person. And so he said, would I not have suffered my whole passion if only one soul was saved? So each one of us can say with St. Paul, St. Paul said, he loved me and delivered himself for me. Every single one of us can say that he loved me and delivered himself for me. My sons have, my sins have hurt him so much, they've weighed him down. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they've added to the weight of the cross, they've caused him so much suffering, and yet he loves me and would have done all of this if only I could be saved. St. Hannibal wrote these words, he said, if on account of only one soul doing these hours. So he told Louisa that because she was doing these hours, he was going to spare cities. See, during a lot of the time that Louisa was writing, it was the First World War. And the First World War was something we'll, we'll go into a bit more of that tomorrow. The, the comparison of the First World War when she was writing these things and our own world today and what's ahead of us. The, um, but um, so Jesus told Louisa that he could, would spare cities, like he spared Corato from all the worst effects of the uh, First World War because she was there praying these hours. So if, on account of only one soul doing these hours, Jesus would spare a city of chastisement. And we'll, tomorrow with our reflections from the Book of Heaven, we'll see why does God let the world go the way it is at the moment. What's all the reasoning behind it? There's so much wisdom in that book of heaven to relate to our times. We're going to do that tomorrow, relate this book written, well, particularly the passages written during the First World War because she was experiencing so much, the world was experiencing things that it had never experienced before at that time, suffering and death on a scale that the world had never known. And so um, we have a world where this is increasing and who knows what's ahead of us. And um, what's happened up till now may be little compared with what's coming. And uh, so we can save, if only on account of one soul doing these hours of the Passion, Jesus would spare a city of chastisements and would give grace to as many souls as there are words of these sorrowful hours that one meditates. And how many graces might a community or any group of individuals expect to receive? So when a group prays these, prayers together, <coughs> it's even more powerful. That's why um, there are some online groups now. Jenny Troy over in Perth, she's got groups that pray.
pray the hours of the Passion. Sometimes they're not <laughs> such a convenient hour for us three, especially summertime, three hours different. But um, they, uh, she has, uh, but that kind of thing, people can think about starting a group, a live group or a group online. Because the more that people are doing it, uh, with the rosary, Saint um, Grignon, Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort said these words. He said, If you pray a rosary by yourself, you get the benefit of one rosary. If you pray it with two people, each one gets double the benefit. If you pray with 25 people, each one gets the benefit of 25 rosaries, and so on. So um, that's what he said about the rosary, but that's the case here also with the, the Hours of the Passion, if we have a group doing it together. <coughs> and so how can we do these Hours of the Passion? Well, um, there are different ways of doing it. So, um, sorry. I'm losing the place. Oh dear. Sorry. Oh, where am I? We might talk about the way of doing it a little bit later. So. So, to do an hour of the Passion means to read it attentively, meditating on it, contemplating it, and making it one's own life. Now, it's not just remembering and having pity on the sufferings of Jesus as something that happened many years ago in a faraway place. Rather, it is first of all to enter into the divine will. This is the practice that we're trying to learn this weekend, to enter into the divine will, in which everything is present and in act. So in the divine will, the sufferings of Jesus are not something that happened long ago and that are in the past. They are present and in act. So we enter into the divine will and we find everything that Jesus did is there, there for us. And to participate in the interior acts and sufferings of our Lord. And so much is revealed to us here of the interior acts and the sufferings of our Lord, which are present and in act at this precise moment, so as to repeat his life within us, to grow in his likeness, and to pour upon everyone the infinite value, merits, and effects of his passion. And Hannibal said, the satisfaction that blessed Jesus receives from the meditation of these hours is so great that he would want at least one copy of these meditations to be present and practiced in each city or town. In fact, it would happen then that as if Jesus heard his own voice and his own prayers being reproduced in these reparations, just as the ones he raised to his father during the 24 hours of his sorrowful passion. And if this were done, in each town or city at least, by as many souls, Jesus seems to make me understand that divine justice would be placated in part, and these sad times of torments and bloodshed, as he's writing that during the First World War, its scourges would be stopped in part, and it's so damp dampened. I just put up a picture there of that massacre by the Islam because it was put on the internet. They, they boasted of it and showed it to everybody when these Coptic Christians who were canonized by the Coptic Church and whose names were put into the martyrology of the Catholic Church by Pope Francis. They were the Coptic Christians who were given the choice of renouncing Jesus, becoming Muslims, or being killed. And they all chose not to renounce Jesus, and so they were all cruelly massacred by the Islamist extremists. So, <clears throat> I also tell you that the purpose of these hours of the Passion is not so much that of narrating the story of the Passion, because there are many books that treat this pious topic, it would not be necessary to make another one. 
Well, the story of the Passion is narrated in the scriptures. It's narrated in many books, <clears throat> like, for example, the three books of Meditations on the Passions by St. Alphonsus Liguri. <clears throat> what is the purpose? The purpose is the reparation. It's the big one, making reparation to God. Uniting the different points of the Passion of our Lord. So this is the important part. Unite the different points of the Passion of our Lord with the diversity of the many offences. So, so we could take an example, for example, where um, Louisa will take the different parts of the sufferings of Jesus, like his sufferings in his eyes. So we think of what Jesus suffered in his eyes. Terrible sufferings because when the crown of thorns was there, the um, blood was running down into his eyes and causing him so much suffering. So we have her praying like this, and my Jesus, I adore your most sacred eyes. And I thank you for all the tears and the blood they have shed for the cruel piercing of the thorns, for the insults, derisions, and contempt you bore during your entire passion. And so we relate it now to offenses. I ask your forgiveness for all those who use their sight to offend and insult you. Just think today, where one third of the use of the internet all around the world, there's so much use for the internet, good and bad, one third of internet usage around the world is on pornography. Imagine all the sins of the eyes that are being committed as people look at all these terrible sins. So we are praying, we are relating the diversity of the passion, the different aspects of his passion with the diversity of the many offenses and making worthy reparation for them together with Jesus almost making up for all that the other creatures owe him. So we are, <coughs> and of course ourselves, as we pray these things, we too, have we offended with our eyes? Well, I imagine many of us will say, yes, we've offended with our eyes too. So we have to make up reparation for our own offenses with the eyes. So that's an important part. The purpose of these hours of the Passion is the reparation, making up to him, making atonement, uniting the different points of the Passion of our Lord. So, for example, what he suffered in his eyes. With the diversity of the many offences, and we find how that happens, how many different parts of his suffering are uh, linked to different kinds of sins, and making worthy reparation to them with Jesus. It's, of course it's worthy reparation because we are entering it to him and we're giving the Father what he did almost making up for all the, the, the other creatures owe him. <coughs> From this, the different ways of reparation are present in this, these hours. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm already kind of going over time. Look, I think I'd better come back to this. It's all very important. So I, I'll, because we want to go home and have an hour of adoration and during that time I will be hearing confessions so we'll go and we'll do that now and um, we'll come back and finish this one up later on in the day.